Uh, we are now introducing the great romantic poet Burns. And we are on page 766, 767. Again, I'm hoping that you're looking at dates. And if you are, you're noticing that Burns is a little bit prior, right, to the year 1800 that we gave as one of those kind of really important general dates for the Romantic period. The other thing I want to point out for you real quickly is that Burns is actually not English. He is what? Did anybody see this? Right. He is Scottish. Now, that's hugely important. You want to put a star next to that, a circle that, and here's why. When you read his poetry, a lot of times the language is going to be really difficult because while he's writing in English, he's writing in a Scottish dialect of English, correct? Uh, and if you don't know that, then reading this stuff, both of these two poems in your hymnal, are, are going to be difficult. Before I get there, though, I want to pause for just a moment, and I want to point out something about the way we talk about Romantic writers. The Romantic writers of this peer, of this English Romanticism, we divide into two categories, two groups. We talk about them as Generation 1 and Generation 2 poets. Generation 1 and Generation 2 poets. The Generation 1 poets we sometimes refer to as the old farts. It's a bit irreverent, but that's the way we say it. Or that's the way I say it anyway. Generation 1 poets, normally we will put into that group Blake, who we saw yesterday, Burns, who we see today, as well as Wordsworth and Coldridge. Of that group, put a star next to Wordsworth. He is our greatest example of the Generation I poets. And in fact, you could argue that Wordsworth is the most important single romantic poet of that first generation. Okay? The second generation of poets are what we call the young guns, sometimes we refer to them as the Hellions. These are the three poets of Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Byron, Shelley, and Keats. We're going to read all these guys. I'm just kind of giving you a schemata of how you can kind of think about these two groups of, uh, of writers. These young guys all die young, and they all kind of die kind of tragically young. And their poetry is far more experimental than the older generation. Okay, So much so that, for example, the great lead singer of the, maybe one of the most important bands in American music history, The Doors, Jim Morrison. For most of his adult life, for most of his adult life, he carried in his back pocket a folded up copy of the poems of Lord Byron. For most of his life, he would perform sometimes even with it in his back pocket. It became kind of a book for him that carried important weight. And yet, it's a poet of the second generation romantic poets from the 1800s in English poetry history. Why? Not so much because of what Byron wrote, but because of who Byron was. He was experimental in all ways. For those of you that know the life of Jim Morrison, you know that he also was experimental in all ways. In other words, in many ways you could say it this way. The second generation of romantic poets invent in many ways or make popular sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It is from the second generation of romantic poets that you kind of get that picture of the Hellian poet who does all this crazy experimental stuff. What we think of today is kind of that rock star lifestyle. That, that first lifestyle was actually invented by a guy named Lord Byron. And that's why Jim Morrison kind of carried, the, carried him in his back pocket. Kind of, it's almost like he gave him license, if you will. All right, all right with that in mind, now let's turn to, to birds. Because the poetry is so difficult to work with, I will have you listen to a professional reading by a Scottish poet who will actually read this poem out loud for you. But before we get there, let's do a bit of context. This poem tells a little tiny story that becomes a working metaphor or symbol of something important in life. The story is what? To a mouse, what happens in this poem? Do you have any sense of what's going on? Have you, were you able through your background reading, etc.? By the way, I'll pause. Good students, and now I'm helping you get ready for university. Good students Google everything now. You have it at your fingertips anyway. So some of you will immediately recognize every single one of the poems that we study in this class for the year 
If you Google them, you immediately can find plot summary that will tell you what's going on. You can immediately find some scholar that will tell you about what's been said about this poem, about this writer, etc., etc. Wikipedia alone will cover most of the stuff that we'll be working with, along with, of course, Britannic and some of the other online sources. I highly recommend that you get in this habit of before you sit down to read, just quickly do a little Google search, and maybe, for example, it'll tell you even, in fact, kind of what's going on, right? And that can help your annotation process way, way faster. Whereas you're sitting trying to read this all on your own, figuring it out, you're going to go to some site that tells you, this is a little poem about a guy who's out doing what in the fields? What's he doing? Plowing. He's plowing, isn't he? And he's using the old-fashioned plow, right, where you're kind of behind an animal and you, you know, you got that big, uh, that big metal kind of wedge thing, right? You're tearing up the ground. What does he tear up? He does. He goes over a little mouse's um, house that's down in the ground, right? And there he sees the little mouse, and then he writes a little poem to the mouse, where ostensibly he does two things. One, he apologizes to the mouse for tearing up his universe, right? For tearing up his home. Not unlike the time you were a kid and you kicked over that huge ant pile, and then maybe it occurred to you later, oh yeah, that was the home of all those little ants, and I just destroyed it. That's the observation Burns makes first, is, dude, sorry to the mouse, sorry I tore up, your, tore up your home. The second thing he says is more intriguing, though. The second thing he says is, wait a minute, interesting. In some ways, I guess humans are kind of like this mouse. We work really hard to put together our little world. We think we're safe and secure in our little world. And then someone who we do not know, call it fate or whatever, comes along and goes, smash. And to that degree, the best laid plans of mice and men soon oft go awry. That is to say, get jacked, screwed up. Steinbeck loved this idea so much that he invents a story. Yeah, he invents a whole story, doesn't he? He loves this poem so much. He's like... Dang it, you're right. That is what human life is. I work really, really hard to get everything put together just the way I want it, and then all of a sudden, right, somebody screws it up, right? How many kids had this experience as they were growing up? When mom and dad say, come in, sit down, we got something to tell you. And the kid's like, what? What do you mean you're going to jack our entire family? What? What is, see, happens all the time. The moment we think we're secure, Something comes along, jacks it up. Steinbeck, of course, will name his novel even from this very poem, what? Of mice and men. And of course, mice play a small role in that novel, don't they? I mean, let's be fair, Lenny does have a little, a little mouse at the beginning of the, of, the, of the novel, right? It's dead already. He kills it. Why? Because he pets things too hard, right? Well, no, that's a setup for later in the novel, right? But if you didn't know this poem, that novel doesn't make much sense. For those of you that know that novel, you're like, oh, now I'm starting to get it. That whole novel is about two guys who dream that they are going to finally get some place that can be their own nest. Only, right, come along the plow, the blade of the plow, screws it all up. Burns is playing an interesting game in philosophy in the second observation. In the first, he's just apologizing to the mouse. In the second, he's going to make an interesting observation about human existence. Right about the time you think you've got it all figured out. Yeah. See, that's the way things work, though. And that's life over and over again. Let's now listen to the poem, and then we'll have some continuing observations. All right? You should have your hymnals open now, looking at this poem. And we'll just listen to it. Alright, here we go. Are you ready? What I recommend that you do is don't just listen, but read and follow along, okay? By the way, we're really doing this because the language of Scottish dialect is going to be a little difficult. Once you hear it read out loud, it will help you a lot. Alright, are we ready? Here we go. On putting her up in her nest with the plow, November 1785, Robert Burns. What can you learn from examining the commonplace? In To a Mouse and 
To a louse by Robert Burns. The speakers address creatures that are often overlooked or despised. Read along to discover the insights expressed in these poems. We sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie. Oh, what panics in thy breasty! I need not start away so hasty with bickering brattle. I would be laid to in and chase thee with murdering tattle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. I doubt not why as but thou may thieve. What then, poor beastie, thou may leave? A demon icker in a fray is a smart request. I get a blessing with a leave and never miss it. Thy wee bit housey too in ruin. It silly was the winds are strewing. And nothing now to big a new of foggage green. And bleak December's winds and suing both snell and keen. Thou saw the fields they bear and waste, and weary winter coming fast. And cosy here beneath the blast, thou thought to dwell, till crash the cruel coulter passed out through thy cell. That wee bit heap of leaves and stibble has cost thee money a weary nibble. Now thou's turned out for all thy trouble. But house or how to thaw the winter's sleety dribble and cranridge cold. But mousy, thou art no thy lane in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee, and lay us now but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only touches thee, but och, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forward. So I kind of see, I guess, and fear. Now what's interesting about this poem is the final two stanzas, of course, where the poet speaker begins to identify with the mouse in a really interesting way. We said about Blake that he wrote a poem about a fly, where basically he said the only difference between you and a fly is that you know about fly swatters. That's an interesting idea. You know there's a fly swatter. Sooner or later it's coming. Flies don't know about fly swatters. They just kind of fly around, fly around. The day is going great until... The only difference between you and a mouse, and this is Burns' observation, is that you know about plow blades. My stone. My stone. In other words, a mouse does what he does. He builds his little house under the ground. He's got it all nice and ready for winter. And all of a sudden, along comes this blade of the plow. Wham! Tears up his house. And now he's got no place to live, which means ostensibly he's jacked. But the mouse had no idea of the potentiality of that. All he did was simply build his house. Burns says, though, humans are different. We're kind of like mice, but there's one big difference. We know about <coughs> plow blades, metaphorically speaking, right? We know about plow blades. What's the point? Jot it in your notes. What's the point of that? So what? So we know about plow blades. Big deal. What does he say in the very end of this stanza that makes him recognize he's a little bit even sadder than a mouse is? If you know the plow blade can come, what's the problem? Put it in your own notes. What's the problem? If you know that there's such a thing as a plow blade, see, this is a fascinating insight for seniors. Is it possible that before you graduate in May, something catastrophic could happen and you never make it? Is that possible? Yeah, see, we're, for, of course, Keeley says, absolutely. That's called, the, that's called the, 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 the plow blade. You bet it is. Absolutely. You bet. We're familiar all the time with stories about how someone thought everything was going to go one way and it ends up going a different way. If you look back over the last three years of your high school career, you could probably write down real quickly at 3B at least three moments when your whole world got completely turned upside down or jacked either because you made a decision or somebody around you made a decision or let's just call it fate. Some strange thing happened and all of a sudden you thought life was going to go one way and then it went a different way, right? It's called the plow blade. You didn't, you, but if you think about it, 
by your senior year of high school, you shouldn't be surprised anymore. You know the plow blade is there. You know that inevitably it could come. Of course, what's the ultimate bl uh, plow blade, Mr. Nelson? What's the ultimate blade that comes? Yes. Yeah, right? Our own mortality. That's the fly swatter. We know about fly swatters. Flies don't. We know that inevitably it ends. Much of the poetry of the Romantic period is to try to remind us of this. The poets will have a tendency to say, we can kind of quickly forget we ain't here for long. And because we forget that, we behave in sometimes inappropriate ways. Less than loving, less than kind. Remember, our view of human nature is that humans are not inherently nasty. They behave in nasty ways because they forget about the blade of a plow. See how that works? Once you understand this view, Burns says, you have a different understanding of all things, both great and small. Notice the mouse, really small and inconsequential. It takes a poet to identify with the mouse and say, two things, I'm really sorry I jacked her house. Oh, wait a minute. You had no idea about plow blades, did you? Poor mouse. You put all of your plans together, making your little nest, and I came along in a second and destroyed your universe. But wait a minute. That's kind of like the human existence. We do all this work to try to get somewhere, to do something, and then all of a sudden everything seems to sometimes get jacked, which begs some really intriguing questions. Do we kind of make our own fate, or does fate happen to us? A way I'll ask it is, do you live your life, or does your life live you? Another way to ask this question is, do you have any control over the events of your life and what happens in your life? Or are you inclined to say, you have no control whatsoever? Are we free, in other words, in our life to do what we really want? Or are we inclined to say, I don't know how much freedom I really do have? Question. Are you more free now than you were when you were a freshman? Remember when you arrived in this building, the exciting thing was you got to go somewhere off the campus for lunch. Now as seniors, you see that as kind of silly and sophomoric, and yet, most of you imagine you're going to be more free and have more fun once you finally graduate from high school and get on to the university or whatever it is you're doing. How is that any different from being so excited that you get to go off campus for lunch? Isn't it possible that three days after graduation, you will go, oh, man, this was what I was so excited for for 12 years? Really? This is, this is what? Is that possible? Well, yeah, we kind of know that probably is possible and that all of a sudden it all starts all over again. Guess what? We get to start making a new little nest that probably we won't get to live in for very long because we got to go on to the next project. Life is kind of like this. Building nests and then they get jacked. Building nests and then they get jacked. Of course, it's interesting, Mr. Harder. It almost leads to this question. If I know every time I build a nest, metaphorically, sooner or later I've got to leave it or it gets destroyed, why ever build a nest? Why even care? What's the whole point of living your life? See, this is going to be romantic questions as well. Not so easily answerable sometimes. Depending upon where you are in your life and the good or bad thing that's going on in your life, you can have a tendency to either like a question like that or be kind of frightened of a question like that. Burns has great humor. Let's look at the second of his two poems, To a Louse. By the way, louse just simply means lice, that little tiny, tiny, microscopic almost little insect, right? Okay, that could, uh, that could find its way to the human skin and ultimately is, of course, a blood sucker, right? That's what it does, right? This is what lice do. Now, let's give a little more context and then we'll listen to this one as well. Are you ready? I'll help you on this one as well. Burns, or the poet speaker, we should say, is sitting in church. This very well-dressed, rich woman is sitting in front of him. And he sees on her a little lice. A, a, that little insect, that blood sucker. He sees it on her. She's unaware that he's there because he's so small. And very much like in the first poem, The Mouse, Burns is going to speak 
to the Laos and make an observation or two. For example, this woman who thinks she's so rich and powerful, she has this lice on her, right? Who has more power? This woman who has easily could kill the lice if she knew it was there, or this Lice, who has the ability to kind of be there without being seen. Notice that Burns will play the game of comparison. Which is more important, the bigger or the smaller? It all depends on, let's put it in our notes, perspective. And this will be back again to a very romantic observation. It all is about perspective. What's important, what's not important, is a lot about perspective, all right? Let's listen to this one now, to a louse, and we'll, uh, we'll kind of enjoy this one as well. <clears throat> to a louse on seeing one on a lady's bonnet at church Robert Burns ha where you going you crowling furly your impudence protects you surly I cannot say but you strunt rarely or goes and lace though faith I fear you dine but sparely on sick a place you ugly creeping blasted one of Detested, shunned by saint and sinner. How dare you set your foot upon her, say, fine a lady. Go somewhere else and seek your dinner on some poor body. Swift, in some beggar's half it squattle. There you may creep and sprawl and sprattle with other kindred jumping cattle in shoals and nations. Where horn nor bane, near dare unsettle your thick plantations. Now hide you there, you're out of sight, below the fatral snug and tight. Now faith ye yet, you'll no be right till you've got on it, the very topmost towering height of Mrs. Bonnet. My sooth, right bored, you set your nose out as plump and grey as any grosset. Oh, for some rank mercurial roset, or fell red smedum, I'd get you sick a hearty doset, would dress your drodum. I wouldn't have been surprised to spy you on an old wife's flannin' toy. Or able in some bit daddy boy on his wild coat. But Mrs. Fine Lenardi Fie, how dare you do it? Oh, Jenny, dinna toss your head and set your beauties our bread. You little ken what cursed speed the blast is making. Thy winks and finger ends I dread are notice taken. Oh, what some power the gifty gears to see ourselves as others see us. It would frame money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lay us, and even devotion. It's interesting in the last two stanzas of both of these poems, interesting observations are made. Notice he says in the last uh, two stanzas two things. He says to the lady, don't run your fingers through your hair. You'll send lice all over us. Don't do that. Which, of course, if she could hear him say this, she would be appalled, right? This rich, well-to-do woman sitting in church, uh, you know, because she, of course, doesn't have lice in her hair. But then immediately Burns is able to pivot, as he did in the, in the other poem. And he makes an interesting observation. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could see yourself the way other people see you? She's sitting in church. She has a certain perception of herself. She has no idea of the view of her that he has. Right? She thinks she's all this. He's like, yuck, you got lice, ugh, right? Wouldn't it be interesting to have the view of yourself by somebody else? How do you think your best friend sees you? See, your instincts are to say, he sees me the same way I see me. This poem says, yeah, maybe not. What? You mean there's another way to see me? Uh, yeah. At 3B, we won't do this now, but it could be interesting. At 3B, you could answer a question like this. It's a disturbing one, but Burns says it might be worth its time in, in, in thinking about it. How do you think, and then you start making a list. How do you think your mother, your father, the, or the adults in your life that you're, that you're responsible to, how do you think they see you when they look at you? Now, when we say see you, we don't mean just physically, right? We mean how do they think of you, right? If you, for example, are attached to a guy or a girl, how do you think he or she actually sees you? Notice our instincts are to imagine that if you're looking at me, you see me the way I see me. 
right? Correct? But we're familiar with the fact of any time you've looked at a picture with a lot of people in it and you're in it, who do you look at first to see if you look okay? Notice how it is. We look at ourselves first. We have a certain idea of what we look like, who we are, how we feel, and we kind of imagine everybody around us kind of thinks the same way, kind of looks at us the same way. What if we're not even in the same universe close? Is that possible? Hmm. Now we're making another observation. That's similar to the one we were making earlier about the similarities but differences between you and a, and a fly, for example, or you and a mouse. In a fundamental way, you understand there are other flies out there. Flies don't know this. Flies don't know this. They live their life as a fly life does. You are familiar when you walk the halls of Orland High School, there are other people looking at you. What would it be like to go inside their brain and look out through their eyes and see you? What do you mean? I would look the way I look when I look at myself in the mirror. Blake, uh, Burns says, maybe not. What? Yeah, maybe not. They may not look at you at, as the way you see yourself at all. Especially if we want to analyze from the inside. The physical, yeah, they might have some similar views. But what about from the inside? For example, the things that matter most to you. Do you think it's possible that you look at people at Orland High School and you've got them figured out only to discover maybe you've got no clue who or what they are? Isn't that interesting? Right? The ability to take the other perspective. That's the romantic observation we want to make. I'll say it again. The ability to take the other perspective. To be able to think... There's got to be another view here, not just my view. Right? How does this other person see my actions? How does this other person feel about the words I'm speaking? I once had a senior who came back after this observation and said, Wow, you know what? Yesterday you said that thing about going home at night and sitting at the table and just looking at the person who made me my meal. And really kind of asking... What is her or his perspective of me? And the student said, for the first time, I did that. I actually did that. And I realized that I've been living most of my life kind of blind the way children live their life. Are you familiar with this? Children only see themselves. That's all they can see. That's all they can know. The world is only about them. Take them to a birthday party. They want to have presents even if it's somebody else's birthday party, correct? They, got, they have Christmas Day. They could care less what you get. They're interested in what they get. That egocentrism is of a child's mentality. But as we mature, we start to kind of realize, oh, there's this whole other world at Orland High School. All these other lives are walking the halls as well. I wonder how they see me. I wonder what they think about when they look at me. Now, why would you want to engage in activity like that? What is the benefit of engaging in an activity like that, do you think? Is there any advantage in that at all? Why? What's the advantage, Mr. Ramos, of that, do you think? Trying to imagine how other people see you. Trying to take another perspective. Better you can understand people that way. You might even have less of a tendency to be so enraged or upset, right? Once you begin to try to see the world through other perspectives, you can also have a bit more understanding on yourself. Your view is only one view of a whole bunch of views. Your tendencies are to think your view is the right view, but that's only because maybe you haven't considered other views. Hmm. What an interesting observation. How hard do you think it is to be a parent? To know that there's only a few more days left and then you walk across a track and it's done. It's over. And whatever it is they've done, they've done. And whatever it is they didn't do, they didn't do. What's it like to live with that for the rest of your life as a parent? The screw-ups, you don't get to undo them. You don't get to say later, hey, let's go back and start up. Uh -uh. What's it like to know that for the rest of your life? See, none of you know that perspective because none of you have yet raised an 18-year-old. 
But you might. But you might. What will that be like? Will your son or your daughter forgive you for the screw-ups? Because guess what? You will make them. Guaranteed. That's called being an adult. That's called being human. That's called being a parent. I've had seniors that say, you know what? This observation to me is kind of mind-blowing. Uh, before I graduate, I probably should make sure I start thinking about a perspective other than my own. Good idea. Good idea. By the way, you want to explain why it is two people hook up, get married, and then separate? It's because they cannot take the other's perspective. The world is only seen through their eyes. And guess what? Guys and girls sometimes see the world differently. We know that's true. Right? We know that's true. Without that level of understanding or perspective taking, there can be no true love. All there can be is selfish lust. There can't be love. Love is the exchange of perspectives, even when you don't agree with it. Wow, that's hard to do. Why is that so hard to do, you think, for parents looking at their kids? Well, see, that's an interesting question, isn't it? See, we'll have to, we'll have to ask ourselves that question as we age, too, won't we? All right, finally, let's go to uh, Lorelei real quickly. I'll just make a quick observation here about this one. Or am I out of time? <coughs> I'll set this one up for us then. Lorelei is going to be a, uh, a very famous poem. Of course, here we're going to get into this discussion about guys and girls, guys and girls, right? Uh, is it true that guys ruin themselves over a beautiful woman... Uh, and why come back tomorrow maybe we'll mess around with that one and uh, do a little bit of work with a tight paper as well thank you